first thing, if somebody else is coming, please like sit in the middle because I think it's going to be pretty full. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about my work at Super Giant Games. Like this is my first job in the industry, basically. Uh, I've been there for five and a half years. So basically, what I'm going to be showing is um, some of like the key elements during this during these five years. What I think is like what I consider is like something important in what I do every day at work. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I, I'm from Colombia. I studied visual arts in Colombia, and I also did a, a master in animation here in San Francisco. I previously worked in video uh, uh, editing, motion graphics, to illustration, to animation. I, as many of you, I think bringing characters to life is my passion, and then sort of exploring their personality and how they deal with internal, internal and external conflicts to go design and animation. And I'm going to emphasize in this part, like the animation, the sorry, the design part of the process, because I think it's like something that a lot of, um, especially a lot of animators, they tend to forget about those things very often. Uh, yeah, I joined Super Giant Games in 2012. That was my first, uh, I was the first and, and only in-house studio artist in the company. I didn't have any previous experience in games. So basically I had to figure out like a, my workflow for, the, for every project and then figure out my schedule, um, <clears throat> creating my own rules for like the 3D production and also dealing with my self-doubt since I was very new to the industry. I didn't know much and everybody in the company, they have like five to 10 years experience and they were like already rock stars. So that was like pretty intimidating at the beginning. Uh, so basically I'm in charge of all the 3D pad line from modeling to rendering. At the beginning, I worked with uh, Greg Kassarin, he's the creative director, and Gen C, the art director. Uh, I tried to figure out with them like the design, the design of the character design, and tried to figure out what kind of elements we want to keep that are important for the story, but also what kind of things we have to get rid of, because I don't want to deal with like that many like tiny details in the character, so I kind of like have to find a balance between what we can do in production and the things that we can keep uh, connected to the story, basically. I do also, also some of the rigging. Some of the rigging is done from scratch. Some other ones, like I use auto rig tools. It depends on like what kind of character I'm gonna be doing. The animation part, I work with Amir Rao. He's the, one of the designers and also the studio director. Uh, this is like a key part also for me because I, since I didn't know anything about video games, kind of like I learned a lot from Amir about um, game mechanics how to like implement them and like how to combine, like how actually every animation is gonna, how they work together. Like, like for example, how all the attacks, they work together, uh, things like that. So, and rendering. Uh, well, okay, first thing, uh, modeling. So three, three things that I wanna emphasize in this talk is like, first of all, character design mindset to entire pipeline. This is something that I'm always very, uh, aware of in the process because actually when people, sometimes when people ask me questions about how I build the characters, it's, oh, when somebody asks me for feedback in their work, it's like, it's always, I go to the same point. Like, um, there are some principles that you, a lot of people just tend to forget very easy. Uh, problem solving is your most valuable skill when working in a small team because in my case, I was the, I was pretty much the only one working in Maya. So if I have a problem with Maya, it's up to me to figure it out. Also, since like the project are secret, so there is no way for me to ask somebody else. I'm pretty much on my own in that sense. Um, expand your skill sets in the interest of expressing the character's personality. I think uh, I, le I learned to model. I learned modeling, but that was like I was actually that was not my major, but it's something that I was curious to to see how I can actually improve the the appeal of the characters. How can I actually get them to be to look actually to look and to feel like more real in some in a sense? Um, so we have a, everything is we have a 2D engine. Um, so all the characters are rendered from multiple camera angles. The modeling and rigging have a similar approach to TV or film, which is like we use high poly models. That means like fewer technical problems for me in that sense. Um, Modeling part, as I was saying, like design, I start with that zero exploration of the, of the modeling, like for the modeling. Uh, 
in this part, there is still, even though I already get like a design concept for like from the art director, I still try to figure out how, can I, how can we improve the design. So and also like what kind of elements we wanna emphasize in the in the isometric view because that's a totally different. When you are thinking about the character, that's a totally different beast. Um, again, principles of character design, it's all the way in like in straight versus curves and contrast rhythm. All those things are actually applied in every part of like in every part of the design, like the arms, the legs, the head, everything. Uh, like this is a um, early exploration for for Pyre. Like again, like I'm not still thinking about all those things in the in the character, trying to facilitate like uh, the line of action, the flow of the shapes, uh, what is the part of the center of attention in the character? Like what kind of things I wanna emphasize in the design, and also like in this case, I'm hoping like this kind of shapes are actually showing more of the personality. Like but if, for this one, it was like something that feels more elegant in that sense. Um, Uh, uh, so my, part of my process is also, I mean, like once I receive the concept, I, part of my process is actually to improve it in some way, like try to figure out solve some of the problems and why it's not working, why it's not like a fully like something that we love exactly. So I, here's a sketch that I received from the, from the art director and then kind of like she gave me the opportunity to actually sort, sort of like explore uh, our design options for the character, for the, for the sword. So I, I, I went and I, I just like a, did a little bit of tapering on the shape and then some real, I had some real on the, the lower part of the sword. Uh, so those kind of small elements like later on, you just like start to, we start to improve, but like it's a, sort of like, it's still my, my, my job to actually kind of like add to, to the original design. Uh, next thing is rigging. I, this is super cliche, but I think it's like very important when I'm like, like, at least for me, since I'm like not the only one working on this, is to keep it simple. Like a lot of animators, they tend to be like intimidated by this, by this process, but like if, as long as you have like a basic understanding, like the, the basic principles of rigging, like uh, you can get to build pretty much anything you want. And like, to me, like that, I some pen and paper planning, like actually going, trying to figure out what I really need and what kind of controls I really need. So it's kind of like, saved me a lot of time. And then I, I get to realize that with very simple tools, I get to build any, any kind of character. Yeah, plenty of plugins out there for that. So also it's, you need to explore the tools that you can find outside. I still, in this process, I'm still like, again, considering like um, design principles because uh, I want to make sure that like some of those concepts are still applying the, in the character in animation. So I need to figure out what kind of, how many controls I'm going to have based on that. Like if I want to get like more straight, straight and curves in the character, in the poses, uh, the contrast, rhythm, reliability, personality, all those things are like considered like during the rigging process because I need to figure out how many controls I'm gonna have, or how many plain shapes I need to add to the character and things like that. So, uh, yeah, so basically also like, again, like it's another thing that I need to keep in mind, really, is like uh, what, what kind of parts I wanna be to, I want them to be like, the principle like something solid versus flexible. That's something that I like add in the character to make sure that some parts are still very like rigid, but like you can you have the freedom to let other parts to be more um, flexible. Uh, I the way that I approach this is basically like I break everything into models. I think it's uh, the like for example for this caravan it was like everything was built like in three in three sections. It was like the main body, the platform, and the horn. And then I, I work like uh, individually in every piece. That was for me very easy just to like solve any rigging problem without thinking about the whole thing, which is kind of like, it can be very overwhelming. So dividing this way was like way easier. And later on, during production, the designers decided they wanted the caravan to fly. 
So in the, the same sense, because everything was built this way, it was very easy for me to add like another model to the rig and then just like add wings. And then later on, they wanted to be on the water. So that was another option. So it was like, by having everything breaking down this way, it was like way easier just to me to, to add and then to animate. So some of those things, like for example, for the caravan in, in Pyre, like that was something that I learned from working in transistor, which is basically well, it's the same principles. Like when, once you break the, the rig into very simple models, sim simple sections, like the, the eyebrows are just like one section, eyelids are another section, the jaw is another section. So kind of like that, this, this mindset kind of helped me to just like do it again and again in different rigs. Like in this case, the, uh, that's the other thing, like, it's it's a very small company. So basically, sometimes like if I want to try something, like in the in this case, the Fisher rig is like it's it's pretty much like a, I mean it's up to me in many cases. Like I have the freedom to just like explore whatever I want to in the character. So in some point that there were like a period of time I didn't have that much to do, so I decided to figure out how to rig the face, and then that's that's all sort of like. I've been using that for a while in the, after that, so. Uh, next three animation. So everything is, uh, basically everything is like between 60 to 64 camera angles. And uh, average is like 2,500 PMGs per animation. Everything is rendered, like I just be ready for all the rendering. All the lighting is attached to the camera. So this is like, the way that I produce all, all the animations, basically. I, the, it, the, yeah, the lighting is attached to the camera, so basically the lighting is also rotating around the character the whole time. So some of the key elements for, for animating isometric for me is like at least eight angles should communicate the main idea of the animation. So I start with like the basic like eight angles that, I, that the character is gonna be in. And I go in the, in the viewport in those eight angles, like to figure out the shape. This is super, this is what, like one of the key things for me because like every time that I'm not actually animating and I'm stuck, I like, trying to like, I, because I feel like it doesn't look as good as I was expecting it to be. I just go back and I do over that and that's like completely different. To immediately see the difference between what you were like thinking and when you actually going up in like, um, on the viewport. Uh, yeah, so in this process, I'm still continuing adjusting the, the main angles, like line of action, tilt, twist, flow shapes, all those things. And there is still have the color adjustments that are happening in this process because that, that at this point, we start to see the character in, like, in, the, in the isometric and in the game, combined with all the other assets, the environment, so we need to adjust the, I work with the art director to figure out how can we like, improve the color in the character. In, and the last part of this process to me is like adding like a, a lot of uh, in-between blend shapes. Uh, so I use a tool that is called Shapes for Maya. It's very, it's been very useful for me because I, I, I like it to do like corrective blend shapes and sometimes like actually, and I get to animate between them and blend them during that process. So. Uh, it's sort of like, because I'm, because my rigging is still, and sometimes like my, in the rigging process is not enough what you have, the shape that you can get. So this is like the last step in the process where I go and like actually polish the silhouette more, polish the shape that I want more. So, uh, performance, uh, this is another part since we are doing a, we're doing RPGs, there are moments in the story where we need like a very specific animations that, that follow the story. So the way that I work on this is like I break down the, the main ideas of the, of the animation. So kind of like those, those, main, those main ideas kind of define like how much it's gonna take me to, to produce them. Well, yeah, of course I need to answer all the questions about what is the character emotional state, uh, where is the character coming from, and how much time do I have to animate those things? So kind of like based on that, I need to find like a balance between what I can do in the time that I have. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, another key thing for me, like in this working at Supergiant Games, I think uh, I'm working with the designers. Um, I started to use locators a lot. That was like something that I learned way before, but I never actually got to implement it. Like in every animation that I that I do now, there is at least one or two locators because this is the way that I can actually work, like figure out the timing for the animations very quick, and then also adjust the timing, work with the designers, see if it's working, see if it's com like uh, combined with other animations, it's working well, and then after that I can actually go and animate the, the rest of the body. So that way it's like I'm not spending a huge amount of time animating the whole character, I just like animating like simple locators, and then I define like the, I just like a box, I parent them to a box so I can I sort of get a sense of the, the, the volume. That's enough for me to actually work to show the designers, basically. Um, so yeah, okay, so, so yeah, so basically there is a, in this case, there is a, there's one locator that is sort of defining the, the translation and the character, translation in Y, and then there's another one for the rotation, and then there's a third one for the translation in C of the, of the main character. Uh, doesn't happen from the beginning. Like at the beginning, I was just exploring just with one simple locator. Then I had like another one. Still, I was not happy with that result, so I had the third one, move the character, and then start to change the the position of the character. So that was like pretty useful. See, if I want to, in this case, if I want to, for some reason, the designer want me to, they want the character to jump even higher. That it was way very very simple for me to just adjust that like very quick. A uh, similar idea here. This is a main locator that is actually driving the main animation. And then there's another one for the character going going down. I'm gonna show you in another. This is a like, like this is a in transistor. This is what like a, one of the key elements. Like I was I used in the locator just to drive the the sword. The sword was so big that it was like it was the main thing that when you see it in isometric, it was like the main thing that you're gonna see. So to me, it was like the most important. And for the design, it's also very important that you get like you get to read what is happening with the sword from the beginning. So this is what I with what we render and we test it in the game, and after that, I just go and animate the rest of the body. In some cases. It's fine because in some cases I didn't, I didn't even know what the body was going to do. I just like knew exactly what we wanted the sword to do, and then based on that, I have to figure out the rest. So it's like an inverse process in this case, which it works really well because uh, the designers just get an idea of what is what is going to happen in that animation way before I animate anything else. Um, So yeah, I, I keep uh, with the locators. It kind of helps me to keep everything very clean. Like here's an example of like one of the locators. Like this, it's figuring out what, when the character is like going down, and then also the hips are like the other section. And then you can see how here like oh, I transfer all everything to the to the locators, and also the rotation of the character is one is, is based on one locator, and then the hips are like I add like extra small details to what I want the character to do. That was like key during uh, during part. That was very important because um, the timing of those locators. Actually, I just reduced them for every other animation since everything here has to be synced with um, FX with other elements that designers are doing. So the timing has to be very specific. So to make sure that we don't waste a lot of time like trying to adjust the timing to every specific animation, it was very just to me to replace the character. Uh, the timing is already there, so it was very easy to just like add a new character to to those locators. So okay, last so yeah, last part of the process for me is a rendering. Uh, we have a render farm in the office. I, everything is exported in EXR format. Multi-channels. I combine all those uh, all those layers in After Effects, and also the shadows are baked into the final render. Canvas size is between 300 by 300. 
1024 by 1024. It kind of takes like three to seven hours of rendering per animation. That's something I need to be aware of when I'm working because I have to wait like three hours to see an animation actually working in the game. So I, need, I usually have like plenty of like other animations at the same time that I'm doing because I have to wait for rendering time. This is the last part of the process. <clears throat> After that, uh, so I, st I still, after that, so basically we need to, we are trying to also, as part of my job, we are also trying to figure like uh, what kind of merchandise we can do for the, for the, for the fans. So like, this is like the art direction that I go in this, in this project was to make it look like candy. That was like the main concept. And then based on that, I still have to keep all those ideas that we had in the original design, like all, all those shapes and how they combine. If you have everything, very, like it's, it's still very clear, so it's very, it should be very easy just to translate those to something new. Uh, yeah, this is another example. There are all the things that I do when, like, when we are not working in any game at all. So yeah, things that we do for, for packs. Or, I'm still like exploring, like to get printing, see how the characters look, and like, and like a real, in like a real figure or things like that. Um, this is a yeah. So again, like I think uh, when you are working with external contractors, I think it's very important that you are very specific about about the design because a lot of probably 80% of the time they will do something different. <laughs> so. The more, the more information you give them, the better. So they actually don't let them come up with some interpretations of what they think it is. <laughs> because uh, it's, also, it's usually, it's, I mean, it took a long time to figure this out, so you, kind of, you try to make sure that it still be true to the, to the game. Uh, last thing that I want to mention here, I think it's like, I think it's important that, like, uh, I think it's important that you are still have, like a, a point of view of what you do because it, it, I think for me at least, like, when I got hired to design games, I didn't have any experience in games and I actually didn't have any proof of previous work. But I think uh, what I feel the main reason for them to hire me was because I have like a very specific um, voice in the work that I was doing. So. Even though I didn't have anything, I didn't understand at all how to make a game, basically. So, uh, so yeah, I think, uh, and, and the, basically, you still need to have a specific point of view of what you do, but also work with the constraints of the of the product because it's still, at the end, it's like we have you are even though it's a very small team, you are still part of a group of people, and then we are trying all of us. We are trying to push a specific idea. So. Like right now, actually right now, we are, we are looking for a 3D artist in the company. And then like one of the things that I, I'm considering a lot is like somebody that can actually understand drawing very well. Because that's, even though if the, the modeling part is not really good, but if they actually understand, if you can see it in the drawing and you can see how they interpret those shapes in drawing, and then you can tell that, I mean, you can see how they are, the way they are thinking. So it's very easy for, if the, if they are not really good at C brush, but they, they, they get the idea, so it's very easy just to translate that into 3D layer. Just like, it's just a matter of time. Um, things that I like also I want to mention, like, uh, it took me a while while working on Supergiant. I think it took me like two years to actually understand like that. Other parts of your life are actually affecting the, the quality of your work. So, uh, you have to deal with all the stuff like, apart from like, Life that for some reason, um, yeah, it's not working. I, I, I'm very careful about not having crunch time. Like I haven't had any crunch time in five and a half years at Supergiant Games. I, at 6 p.m. I leave the, the office and no matter what happens. <laughs> I have worked remotely from five different countries. I think it's, uh, the company is very small, it's very flexible, the rules are very flexible, so you are, it's, give me the freedom to actually go and travel and still do my work from any place. 
Um, I'm actually actively also working on other art projects and exhibitions, toy, toy design, video, photography, and I'm still taking classes because I have, even though it's already like five and a half years, but still like uh, there's a lot to things that I, there's a lot to things that I need to improve. So the main the main things to for me to to that I want to emphasize, of course, was character design mindset to entire pipeline. So I need to be aware in the whole process. Then they like keep that always like, in mind in the, in the entire production. Problem solving is your most valuable skill. Uh, this is gonna show every time at work, like every week, there is something that you need to figure out in the time. Usually, it's usually it's usually Maya with some crash or something. <laughs> uh, seek opportunities to expand your skill set. I think it's also. I have a lot, I see a lot of people that get stuck in just being an animator and then they don't try to explore any other options. And then I see there's a lot of companies now they just hire people for like a specific specific task. So I think it's expanding expanding those like um, skills is always like valuable for the for the team, valuable for the way that you work with other people. So I think it's like it's important to just like it's something that you can try on your own like from time to time. So it's not. So you are not getting stuck in just animating. And it's all in the interest of expressing the character's personality. So, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Any questions? Questions? This working? Yeah. So you were saying about the um, the render time thing. I was just curious. When you also showed like more pre busy thing where hey, it's just the sword moving. I assume that doing a render with just like the one element moving, whatever, you could test that in game quicker than three hours, or whatever the time. Yeah. Was. Yeah. Yeah. That's still yeah. It's just still you still have to render it, but like it's, I don't. Basically, it's, it's quicker because I don't have to animate the rest of the body. So I can I got, like I can do that in like probably like ten minutes, render that and then show it to the designers, and then from that they decided like we decided like if the timing is right, yeah. and after that I go and I do the animation, which the animation will take like a day or two or three, whatever it takes. Yeah. And just if I could have one more question as well, um, you seem to essentially own the uh, entire pipeline. And I'm curious, because there's, there's another person at the studio who is the like, art director, is that correct? Yeah. So how, does the, um, how do the two of you work together? Because you have like, such an incredible fine-grained control over the end product. Presumably, you, you guys must have to have a, a very good working relationship. Because like, she's, oh, is it, sorry, I don't know who it is, but um, yeah, it's like you are this single focus point through which everything is getting uh, put on screen. Wait, again, it's about, I mean, how, how I work with like... Uh, with yeah, yeah, how does, just how does that relationship work, uh, like ma making these games? Because it's, it's unusual for someone to so entirely own the pipeline. Well, it's, I think, um, it's, I don't even know how to put it because I think it's like, it's, it's been a while. At the beginning, it was like we get. I, I just like try to understand what the 2D is, like the the, the concept, like the, the the art director, what she was doing, and the style. So I need to like uh, I still need to like think about that. But like in some point, uh, we know each other very well, so it's very easy just for us to like. I, I'm already already guessing what she's gonna say, and she's already guessing what I'm gonna say. So kind of like at this point, it's. It kind of, it's not, we don't need to communicate that much about that kind of stuff because we already know what is going to happen, more or less. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. That's great. No. Hi. <clears throat> you were saying you're from Colombia? Yeah. I'm from Latin America too. And many of the shapes and color choices and way to stylize some of the characters ring very familiar. So is there anything like 
from Colombia that bleeds through the project, like that ends up being part of like uh, your work? There, there is. I uh, mean, <laughs> there is some characters actually. I don't have them here, but like there is some characters actually there. I actually did them dancing on salsa. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, but uh, yeah, so from time to time there's stuff like that that I do. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, okay. Just trying to wave at you. We're good. Is it cool? Can I ask a question? Just confirm. Want really quick, one more? Yeah, um, okay. so what kind of training? Uh, resources would you recommend to artists? Because the part where you're emphasizing um, improving your skills really resonates to me as a professional in the industry. Well, I, I take classes everywhere, but I think as like, I'm always trying to figure out, trying to find like the right teachers because that's like the key element. Like sometimes you find like a good class, but it's um, probably is not I mean, you have to find the right mentors, basically. So you have to find, and then which ones are you want to, the kind of people that you want to learn from. So I don't have like a specific resources that I will suggest. You need to explore. Depends in animation; it's always different. But like rigging is also different. Like I, some of the rigging that I learned was from a guy from um, from Naughty Dog. It was a really amazing teacher. But like there is an also, I mean, it's. It's always like different places, so, and then you have to be very open. Like sometimes, like some of the classes that I take, they are like terrible. <laughs> but it's it happens. But you stay. I mean, you always find something out there. But yeah. Okay, so trial and error, and yeah, are yeah, you pretty much going yeah. online or in person, typically or mix. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>